Now, the greatest radio shows of all time. Suspense. The Shadow Node. Washington calling David Harding, counter spy. Classic radio theater. The Great Gildersleeve. Faber McGee and Molly. Dragnet. Gunsmoke. The Lone Ranger. Now, step back into our time machine with your host, Wyatt Cox. Good evening, friends of the Inner Sanctum. Bob Bailey and Virginia Gregg start off an hour of Bob Bailey. This is an episode of Let George Do It from March 26, 1951. The West Coast program sponsored by Standard Oil. No escape from the jungle. Personal notice. Dangerous my stock and trade. If the job's too tough for you to handle, you got a job for me, George Valentine. Write full details. I wonder if the time will ever come when George Valentine runs into a problem that's even too big for him to handle. So far, he's been lucky, but you never know. Take this uh, Peter Van Rassel that he's about to tangle with. Peter is one of those charm boys with an accent who just arrived here from Rangoon. He looks like the type of character who could handle himself under almost any circumstances. But he must have hit a snag, because right now, all Peter has in mind is let George do it. My dear Mr. Valentine, my name is Peter Van Russell. I'm a research chemist for one of the rubber companies with offices in Rangoon. I have devoted my life to my work, which I suppose to someone else would be about as dull as my own person. It has been years since I have even followed the American newspapers, let alone kept abreast of your customs. I have never been in your city before. Now, I say all this so you will understand how impossible it is for me to find, to locate, a certain man without your help. A man who, like myself, has just arrived from Burma. A man who is here, but is not here. It is a debt of honor, you understand, purely a personal matter. I must see him. I only have a few days before I, I return to the jungle. Oh, wait a minute, Mr. Van Russell. You said this man is here, but he isn't here. No, I assure you, it is just as confusing to me as it is to you, Miss Brooks. Well, to start at the beginning, what's this man's name? Uh, Hollowell. Terence Hollowell. Uh-huh. He's, uh, oh, he's about 40 years old. Tall, quite distinguished. Hollowell, huh? Does he live here? Did you look him up in the phone book? Oh, yes, yes. He maintains a residence. Well, then what... Now, I telephoned, you see, from my hotel, and I was informed by a caretaker that Mr. Hollowell won't be arriving from Burma until tomorrow. Well, okay. Then he just hasn't got here yet. Now, yes, he has. I came by plane. I'm sure he was at least a day or so ahead of me. Here. Now, that's a little torn. Uh, cablegram. Van Russell, Pan Am, Honolulu. Was waiting for me at the airline's office yeah, in Hawaii. Let me Hawaii. see that. Mm. Waste of time. You're trying to contact me. Go right in detail, but assure you that under present circumstances, our meeting one another would be needlessly painful to you. A stroke of fate, that's all. Please understand, Terence Hollowell. Now here, this, this piece here, you see? That cablegram was sent from this city. He sent from here. So he is in town. Yet... At his house, they insist he is not. He is here, and he isn't. <laughs> uh, Mr. Van Rossel, apparently this man doesn't want to see you wherever he is. Uh, what sort of person is this, Hollowell, anyway? Oh, a traveler, a, a lecturer. You know, most charming fellow. He stayed with me for a week or so at my plantation north of Rangoon. No, but so easygoing. Not the sort to be mixed up in anything troublesome, you know? And you have no idea what he's talking about in that cablegram? No. And I think I should find out, don't you? There is a pearl necklace, ten black pearls and a necklace. What's that? Well, that's the only thing I can think of. Hollowell is a man who admires beauty. I helped him to obtain a necklace, that's all. Oh, it's valuable. He paid nearly every penny he had, nearly $2,500 for it over there. So it's worth a lot more here. Oh, yeah, yeah. But what could be that... Yeah, I understand you, Mr. Van Russell. What could have happened to a perfectly nice guy that made him disappear and yet not disappear? Yeah, Precisely. Only what do I do when and if I find him? 
What is it you wanted to see him about in the first place? Oh, naturally, Mr. Valentine. I will explain anything you wish when the time comes. But right now, the urgent question seems to be, why is Terence Holloway trying to hide? And most important of all, where? George, Mr. Van Russell has already tried calling the house here. I, I can't see any reason Always for Always start trying. with the obvious, Angel. Maybe this Hollowell just doesn't want to be bothered with our Dutch friend. You know, look me up sometime, and then the people take you up on it and you're stuck. But he was his guest in Burma. He wouldn't be rude. Wait a Hold on a minute. Good morning. Uh, good morning. Are you from the house here? I mean... It uh, seems so unusual. All those wonderful little birds out at this time of morning. Don't you think? Well, they should be sleeping in the middle of the day. Yes. But it's not hot, is it? There's no reason for them to be sleeping here. <laughs> well, we just wanted a few... Oh, uh... my, no, no. I'm not from the house. No, no, indeed. You see? I have my umbrella. Yes, I see. Yes, uh, this is Mr. Hollowell's house, though. I only carry my umbrella from habit, I suppose. It's ridiculous, isn't it? Uh, you haven't rung the bell yet. Yes. Yes, it's Mr. Hollowell's house. It's his. It's not like him, though, do you think? We've never met him. Oh. Oh, you've never heard him talk. You've never heard the beautiful words he uses. It was such a sad expression. But so exciting. All the romantic places... The intimate, beautiful thought. What did you say? Oh, no, I haven't rung the bell, no. You may if you wish, but it won't do any good. Why not? She's at home. Perhaps she'll throw you out like she's at me. What? His wife, Mrs. Allowell. Yes, his wife. Oh, don't mind me. I'm just waiting. Just waiting. <laughs> that maid. I asked you who hired that maid. Lisa, for heaven's sake. Not Lisa. they over 18 and straight out of a model agency, if you ask me. You've seen her. How could any man help seeing her? But I tell you, George, I listen. Didn't. Yeah, then the maid said to wait in the hall. But... I won't have her around the house. Now, I did not, Lisa. Now, please, why do you care? It's not your house anymore. You get your separation checks. That's all. That's that why I'm here. I haven't had a check for two months. You've been holding out again. There isn't any money, I tell You're you. You're lying. Oh, Lisa, darling, I couldn't lie to you if I tried. Don't you believe me? Uh, hello. What Is that? anybody... Oh, excuse me. Oh, how do you do? Um, excuse us. I I'm Miss Brooks. This is Mr. Valentine. The maid said... Of course, of course. Visitors all over the place. Why not? I'm Mrs. Hollowell. Oh, but then you must be Mr. Hollowell. My name is Cy Kirby. And you walked in and are offended because I make a lot of noise. All right, I don't mind. I'm a nasty woman. Mr. Kirby is my husband's business partner. He belongs here. I don't. He's the one you want to see. Uh, what club do you represent, Mr. Valentine? Uh, what club? <laughs> well, tell me you're a process server. Which one of my husband's rich women friends do uh, you... Lisa, isn't it about a lecture? Really, that's our only business, you know, travel talks. And <laughs> I just assumed you were like the lady out there with the umbrella or the committee of women out in the hall. Uh, no, no, no. I, uh, newspaper, that's all. Uh, wanted an interview. We understood Mr. Hollowell had just arrived from Burma. He won't be back until tomorrow. Uh, yes, that's right. Uh, tomorrow. Oh, I see. Well, I understood he might have arrived already. No, but I'm sure Mr. Kirby can tell you everything you want to know about my husband. Uh, of course. Every bit of publicity counts. Uh -huh. Well, uh... Look, I wondered if we could get a picture of Mr. Hollowell. Oh, well, naturally. Delighted, I suppose. Even Burton Holmes needs a little press cooperation now and then. Uh, come along. We'll find a photograph in his desk. George, you'll never locate a man just by carrying his picture around. I will buy a telephone pad, Angel. What? Yeah, it was on his desk. There's the name of an employment agency scribble on it. It may be just a cockeyed hunch, but come on. Flavin Home Service Employment Agency. No, no, Mr. Flavin, there's nothing wrong. I just phoned you to check, that's all. So Mr. Hollowell did hire the girl himself, huh? I see. 
And he phoned from the Benson Hotel. Okay, thanks a lot. Now, the man in the photograph? Why, yes. Oh, yes. He's staying here at the Benson. His name is... Uh, could you just tell me what his room number is, please? Mm, 325. Oh, but his key is in. I think he's probably across the street. Uh, what's this all about, Mr. Valentine? You mean that theater over there? No, no, a little jewelry store. I've seen him go in there before. Jewelry? Yeah. <gasps> George, remember the pearl necklace? Yeah. What's that? Uh, I don't know, friend. It's all too much for me. Uh, suppose we just wait. What's the matter? Give me that photograph. George! That's him, isn't it? Oh. May I have my key, please? 325. Mm-hmm. Uh, these people were just uh, asking about you, Mr. Smith. Oh, they were? Mr. Smith? Why, yes, young lady. Mind if we step over here a second? Well, no, not at all. But uh, what do you wish to see me about? It's Hollowell, isn't it? Isn't that your name? <laughs> oh, why, yes. Yeah, but who are you? I, uh, I don't understand. Neither would the clerk over there if you told him. Neither would I. No, I don't think there's any law against a man being incognito, is there? Who sent you? My wife? Her lawyer? <laughs> well, that's the obvious explanation, isn't it? She has a little trouble collecting money from you, I understand. Well, I suppose everyone has money troubles. Never mind, days. I'm not interested. But uh, what is it you want? Every minute I want less and less, Buster. Come on, Brooksy. We've done our job. Nice to have met you, Mr. Hollowell. But, Mr. Valentine, I located I would... him. That's all you hired me for, Mr. Van Russell. Yeah, the Benson Hotel. Now, you've done a very good job. Oh, wait a minute, I... wait a minute. Not so fast, friend. You said you'd do a little explaining yourself. Why he sent a wire brushing you off is another matter, and oh, I want to know. of course, yes. I said I would tell you. Well, a, a debt of honor, that's all. And I appreciate so much your finding him. I am really not concerned with whatever his little problems are. Well, then? Because I am only here from Burma, you understand, to kill him. March 26, 1951, Let George Do It on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. Now on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox, more of Bob Bailey, Virginia Gregg, Let George Do It, March 26, 1951. Back to George Valentine. The business of Terence Hollowell is travel talks. Only from what his partner says, they're not making much money at it these days. Hollowell has trouble with his wife, too. But most of all, he's likely to have trouble with your client. Because if your name is George Valentine, then you have a harmless-looking client, Mr. Van Rossell, who has just said, thanks for finding Hollowell, because now he can kill him. Hey, wait a minute, you... Van Russell gone, George? Oh, yeah, sure. Hung up and ran. But it'll take him at least 15 minutes to get over here to the hotel. Well, he wouldn't just come and kill him. Why would he tell you? Why would he warn anybody and then do it? Oh, lots of crazy people in the world, Angel. But this is no time to argue about it. Hollowell went upstairs to his room, didn't he? Mm, that's right. Okay, play it safe. Find the house detective. Tell him what it's all about. Oh, as if I knew. Tell him to keep Hollowell there until I meet you. Where are you going? To try and tie this together fast so it does make sense. The jeweler's across the street, Angel. That pearl necklace is the only thing I know about that ties a would-be murderer to his corpse. Ah, yeah, yeah, beautiful. Such pearls I have never seen. You mean this is it? This one right here? Oh, uh, yeah. Relic from the days when there was time to collect, when beauty was not rhinestone. Uh -huh. Now, look, I asked you... Ah, so even to buy something, you must be in a hurry. All right, all right. Fifteen thousand uh, dollars. There, there, you see? Now you think it is too much. Such a hot day, you, you, you should take your time. 
You should sit down. No, no, I was just surprised they were for sale. But with Mr. Hollowell's pearls, you asked about... Now, look, he sold them to you. These are the ones he bought in Burma. I know the man who helped him get them. Uh, yeah, well, well, of course he sold them to me. Now I sell them. But he's been spending a lot of time over here. His hotel clerk said he what, was over... Why, what do you do? Make puzzles for yourself? Two days I spend making another necklace for Mr. Hollowell. That's all. A uh, cheap, bad one called just a food uh, 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 junk. Wait a minute. You mean he sold you this one for a nice profit but got you to make an imitation? Uh, every time you turn around, it's got to be a mystery. No, 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 no. No imitation, just a bad one, that's all. Pearls, yeah, black ones, but nothing illegal, nothing to fool anyone. Nothing to fool a jeweler. <laughs> Only to fool a wife, perhaps. Huh? Ah, I know this man from before. Well, what's wrong with that? I, I fool my wife. You fool yours, don't you? So, all right, it's a hot day. Yeah, Brooksy. George, he's gone. Mr. Hollowell's gone. You sure? He piled some of his luggage into a cab the minute we left earlier. Oh, brother, everybody disappears. No, George, the starter remembered the address, or at least enough of it. Well, where did Hollowell go? His home. The big travel expert's gone home, that's all. <laughs> such a strange thing to do, such goings on. Lady, this, this, George, you should put in a mystery show. Mr. Valentine, I'm so sorry I was rude this morning. Oh, not at all, Mrs. Hollowell. Through here, please. He's unpacking now. And look here. He brought me this. Hmm. Pretty necklace. Oh, you already noticed it. But see, it's real black pearl. Nice husband. He bought it with his last penny in Burma. I know it was because Sai keeps the books and he told me. How could I stay angry at a husband like that? Oh, Terence. Terence, darling. Yes, my dear? I, uh, I won't keep him long, Mrs. Hollowell. <laughs> and he wants to kill me, you say. Van Russell. <laughs> Imagine. Imagine his even being here. Sure. It's very amusing. He's insane. Of course you know that. Lived in the jungle too long. Nothing but work. I think it's very amusing the way your wife fell for the phony necklace, too, Buster. What's that? Oh, don't worry. I'm not going to tell her. She'd start worrying again about that pretty maid you hired. <laughs> <laughs> How much does your partner, Cy Kirby, know about that little profit you made on the necklace? Buying it for $2,500. Buy? Well, didn't you? In Burma? The real one? Or is that what Van Rossell is upset about? Something to do with that necklace? Oh, get out of here. You've given me your little warning, and thanks very much. Goodbye. Oh, no, no. My curiosity gets bigger and bigger the more this I talk. This is my house. I've done nothing criminal. I got out of here, I said. George. Hello? Oh, George, it's Lieutenant Johnson. Yeah, I asked him to call us here. Yes, Lieutenant. Yes? Mm hmm. George, they finally found Von Russell. They picked him up at 5 o'clock. He's been watching that hotel of Hollowell's all afternoon. Oh, give me that phone. Hello, Johnson. Let me talk to that guy. No thanks for picking him up. No thanks for anything. All right, all right. Thanks. Would you? Besides, you're not going to talk to him. He just fainted. Besides, he's downtown and I'm not. What? He what? Things got hotter after you left, I guess. I'm out at the Hollowells, and boy, do you get things turned around. That Van Russell of yours is the only one who couldn't have murdered him. Murdered? You heard me. Hollowell, the big travel and charm boy, stopped three bullets. I don't know. I barely got here myself, Valentine. Well, his wife was upset. First she was hating him, then she yeah, was... Yeah, 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 I got that. But after you left, she drove to the hotel to get some more of his baggage for him. Took the maid with her. They were the ones found the body when they came back. Yeah. Right here in this hammock. That's right. In the hammock. Yeah. What a light. Not if you did. We got the place pretty well roped off and fast, but it's big. Lots of space. Cy Kirby. Been this guy's partner for years. Says he was upstairs and didn't hear a thing. We tried it out and you can't hear oh, from wait there. Minute, Johnson, wait a minute, will you? What's the matter? Look, Johnson, I could have stopped it. I could have added up all the little tips and stopped Take it. Take it easy. The guy was a heel, big soft soap artist, big fake, romance with a buck. But I could have figured out why a man would tell me he was going to kill in advance. Sure, sure, a debt of honor. Look, I told you Van Rossell wasn't within he miles. He hired me to find the guy. He showed me a wire. 
But suppose it wasn't his wire. Yeah, torn, that's right. First part of the name was torn. Beat yourself with something I can recognize, will you? Look, Johnson, every little thing adds up in one direction. So funny the bird should be awake in the middle of the day, she said. Said it wasn't hot on a very hot day. Look, I know, friend. I know I'm crazy, but so's murder. We don't even scratch the edges of it, Johnson. But an umbrella does. Huh? Yeah, look. And we'll wrap this up following some messages from your favorite radio station. March 26, 1951. Bob Bailey, Virginia Gregg, let George do it on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. Just when you thought it couldn't get any better. Mike Lindell and MyPillow launching the MyPillow 2.0. Now, when Mike invented MyPillow, it had everything you could want in a pillow. Now, nearly 20 years later, he's discovered a new technology that makes MyPillow even better. Of course, the patented adjustable fill of the original MyPillow, but now with brand new fabric with a temperature-regulating thread, it's the softest, smoothest, and coolest pillow you'll ever own. Say goodbye to tossing and turning and flipping your pillow over in the middle of the night. And more great news on the MyPillow 2.0. Buy one, get one free offer with my promo code WYATT. MyPillow 2.0 is 100% made in the USA, 10-year warranty, 60-day money-back guarantee. Go to MyPillow.com, click on the radio podcast square to receive the MyPillow 2.0, buy one, get one free offer, use my promo code Wyatt, or call 1-800-928-4715. Now on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox, the conclusion of Let George Do It, March 26, 1951, No Escape from the Jungle. Suppose she came from Burma. Suppose Van Rossel was chasing after her, too, trying to protect her in advance, or trying to get Hollowell protected in advance to stop it. Well, the umbrella over there, can't you see it? Suppose it belongs to her. Suppose she's not a club woman, Johnson, but Van Rossel's wife. George, there she is Yeah, I know, she's got a revolver She's watching us, stay where you are All right, lady, sure now, Don't worry, my name isn't Hollowell I killed him Did you know that? I know, I know But take it easy, please, it's all over No, no, it was all over a week ago He told me that when he left them But I wouldn't believe She was in love with him Oh, George, the poor thing. No, just waiting till he got here to shoot him. Oh, leave me alone. Please, leave me alone. You are Mrs. Van Rossell, aren't you? Yes. Oh, yes, I was. I, I mean... I know. Your husband told me about Hollowell visiting you for a week. I followed him. What of it? So I'm a stupid middle-aged fool. I saw the cablegram that missed you in Honolulu. Get away, please. Please get away. I'm sorry, lady. I want that... All right, Brooksy, take it easy. She's shooting in the dirt. She doesn't want to hurt us. It's just Hollowell that she... Stop what I said! Get away! Hey, that's three shots, Brooksy. And there's three in Hollowell. That makes six. All right, it's all over now, lady. You've done all your shooting. Get away, I said! Oh, brother, have I been wrong? Oh, George, she's pointing it at herself. Hey, look up! Bring that. Yeah. Sure, lady. Still another shell. All right, now let's see your purse. You've got your purse, haven't you? There it is, George. She dropped it. No shells there. Huh. Guess we did some good after all, Angel. Everybody else had a motive, too. Wonder which one shot him first. I shot him. Lady, you fired your gun four times just now. There are three bullets in Hollowell. Three and four are seven. So who shot him first? Cy Kirby, Mr. Van Rossel. He was the only one it could have been. You see the others, his wife and the yeah, I maid. understand, I understand, yeah. Well, I got him fast enough. He didn't have any story cooked up. It wasn't premeditated or no, anything. Of course, of course. I think they'll be able to prove that your wife only shot a dead body, Mr. Van Rossel. Yeah, I see, yeah. Uh, you don't really, do you? I mean, you still haven't told us about your wife and Hollowell. Well, and Kirby, Hannah. that was his partner. Yeah, there was, what, some difficulty? Well, he'd been holding out on him. Over $10,000 profit on a necklace. The only reason Hollowell lied about his return to Kirby was to give him time to arrange for its sale without anyone knowing. 
Been going on for years, apparently. This time, Kirby caught up with him. Oh, it wasn't really that, though. It was Mrs. Hollowell. No matter how mad she got at her husband for carrying on with other women, no matter how many times they separated, she always went back to him. And Kirby couldn't stand it. He loved her, too. It's always love, one way or another. The same as you're coming after your wife, even after she'd left you. I suppose there will be a trial. I suppose my wife... Well, no, it will... certainly will be an investigation. Maybe about shooting somebody who's already dead, but... Why won't you talk about your wife? Why won't you tell me what I want to know, that silly business of the necklace that kept confusing us? That was a wedding present I gave to her years ago. She gave to him. That's all. Nice guy, Hollowell. Yeah. But your wife, I mean, she knows that you came after her trying to help. She knows what you're really like, or she wouldn't have tried to kill Hollowell. Don't you understand that? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, this, this is a dull place we live in. And I have not much excitement myself, not glamorous like the United States. No. We work it out somehow. Don't worry so much. Goodbye. Yeah. What was that line of yours, Brooksy? One way or another, it's always love. Go on, darling. There's nothing I'd rather hear you talk about. You have just heard No Escape from the Jungle, another Let George Do It adventure. Robert Bailey was starred as George Valentine with Virginia Gregg as Brooksy. Our story was by David Victor and Jackson Gillis with music by Eddie Dunstetter. Now this is yours truly inviting you to another visit with Valentine when you will again hear what happens when you let George do it. March 26, 1951, Let George Do It on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. We'll start a new yours truly Johnny Dollar story next. Now on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox, we start a brand new Yours Truly Johnny Dollar story. Uh, this goes back to March 26, 1951, part one of the Lamar Matter. A murder? From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Pat McCracken, Johnny, returning your call. Oh, hi, Pat. How's Southern California? My vacation on expense account, I love it. Well, don't overdo it. Just because the Jolly Roger matter interfered with that vacation you'd planned is no Now, reason. wait a minute. You promise. Full expenses. <laughs> okay. When are you coming back to Hartford? Soon as I clear up the Lamar case. Want okay expenses on it now? Huh? Lamar? Yeah, Pat. This is a case that'll make your hair curl. <laughs> Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. (laughs) Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Universal Adjustment Bureau, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Lamar matter. Expense account? Ah, forget it. I'm on vacation. As far from Hartford, Connecticut, center of the insurance business as I can get. Yeah, I'm in La Jolla, California. And I'm staying in a big, ritzy motel called El Crescenta. Alone. Oh... There is a girl down here. A lot of them, in fact. But one in particular. Bonnie Lamar, her name is. Sounds like somebody in show business, doesn't it? But she isn't. Tall, five feet eight, brunette, pretty as the devil. And I gave her the line that my so-called business back east consists of nothing more exciting than running a filling station. How can you afford to come all the way out here to California for a vacation? To say nothing of staying at the El Crescenta. Rich uncle, Vonnie. Died and left me a couple of thousand to do with as I see fit. This is the way I see fit. Only a couple of thousand. Mm-hmm. Gee, that's too bad. A couple of hundred thousand, I might really fall for you. Oh, Vonnie, how can you? Hmm? 
Well, here I thought these last three days and evenings with you were due solely to my overwhelming personal charms. Your charm has nothing to do with it. Kiss me again, anyhow. With money around, who needed a couple of hundred grand? Yeah, the gal was just about all anyone could ask for. And I don't mean for just a quick vacation time romance. I'd spotted her the minute I'd landed here at this hotel. More like a guest ranch by the seashore. Beautiful, modern cottages set around a big green lawn with a swimming pool in the center big enough for the Olympics. Carports beside the cottages loaded with Eldorados, Continentals, and a handful of foreign sports jobs. And a beautiful big dining room and a building set up to look like an old clipper ship. And food and service worthy of Oscar of the Waldorf. And what was I doing here? On expense account, remember? Yeah, I'd spotted Vani the night I arrived from San Diego after clearing up the Jolly Roger matter and set my sights for her immediately. Naturally, I wondered what so attractive a girl was doing alone here. She cleared that up for me at dinner the second night. I still don't understand why Daddy hasn't arrived yet. Oh? He's supposed to join you on this vacation? We always spend our vacations together. At least we have since Mother died a few years ago. You're an only child? Yes. Really a foster child. Just as we were about to take our plane, some crisis or other arose at the plant. <clears throat> so he made me come along and wait for him. Lamar Metal Products. Lamar Metal... Oh, yeah, yeah. Aircraft components, isn't it? South Bend, Indiana? Yes. You know how crisis can arrive in a business like that. Sure, imagine so. Government orders and all that sort of thing. Yeah. Well, you'll probably hear from him before. Oh. Here, waiter, would you like to get a... Telephone, senorita. A telegram for the lady. Oh? Excuse me, Johnny. Sure. Here you are, Pedro. Gracias, senor. Oh, dear. What's the matter? It's from my father, and I don't like it. Listen. Must delay departure a few more days. Doctor's orders. Oh? Nothing to worry about. Stay there in La Jolla until I join you, love Daddy. Oh, that's too bad. But doctor's orders. There's nothing wrong with Daddy. He had a new insurance examination just a month ago. They gave him a clean bill of health. Uh, what company? Oh, try mutual something or other, but what difference does it make? There's something wrong about this. I'm sure of it. Well, why don't you phone him? Yes. Yes, I will. My cottage is right next door here. Come on. It was none of my business, but the name of Trimutual rang an old familiar bell. Yeah, I'd handled a lot of cases for them. Anyway, she wasted no time in putting through a call to her father's private number in South Bend. Yes, operator? Thank you. I don't know why I didn't go to my own cottage to make this call. Mm, my pleasure. I guess I'm a bit upset by this wire. I don't blame you. There's nothing wrong with Daddy. There can't be. Well, maybe he just made the mistake of mixing too many oysters with too many martinis. Hello? Hello? Daddy, what's this telegram you sent me? Oh. Oh, I see. Oh, well, you had me scared for a few minutes. Oh, yes, fine. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yes, if you must know the truth, I have. Johnny Dollar. Uh-oh. Very. Careful, gal. Oh, he says he runs a filling station, but I don't believe him. <laughs> I'll tell you all when you get here. And hurry, darling, please. All right, Daddy. Good night, dear. Oh, thank goodness. You don't know how close your guess was, John. Oh? It was just a slight case of indigestion. Plus the fact he wanted another day at the plant. Well, good. Then let's go back to the dining room and see what kind of indigestion we can accumulate. Well, that started it. Three days and nights of as much fun and relaxation as I've had in years. A wonderful place to stay, a private beach that I'll wager is second to none on the Pacific coast. Swimming, water skiing, skin diving, sailing, everything. Oh, this was it. Or so I thought. Oh, why make any bones about it? I'm a sucker for romance. And believe me, it wasn't hard to be serious with money. Johnny. Yeah? This is nice, isn't it? Mm-hmm. I... 
I, I don't believe in love at first sight. Do you? Uh, no. No, I, um... But it is nice, isn't it? Hey, oh, gal. Mm hmm? And it'd be much too easy to fall in love with you, Vonnie. And I mean the forever kind. Well, would that be so terrible? You've, you've got one big strike against you, you know. Johnny, what? M-O-N-E-Y, money. <laughs> you lose. Huh? I have nothing, except what my father gives me. You know, allowance and for clothes and things and... <laughs> you know. So you see, I'm just as poor as you are. Only you aren't. Or you wouldn't be staying at a place like this. Another thing. You know absolutely nothing about me. <laughs> No, you don't make a living by running any old filling station. Johnny Dollar at the sign of the Flying Red Horse. Oh, stop it. Well, for all you know, I'm a... I'm a gangster, a safecracker, a jewel thief. Mm. Or worse still, playboy scion of a wealthy family who never did a lick of work in his life. In other words, a worthless bum. Don't say that, Johnny, even in fun. Had you fill them, huh? Yes, and their mothers. Old dowagers trying to marry them off to another wealthy family. Add the name Lamar to their end of the social register listing. Ensure the fortune with another fortune. I thought you said you were poor. Well, you know what I mean. A bunch of worthless fops, that's all they are. I've seen better men among the servants and chauffeurs, the little Mexican boy who helps one of the gardeners, and the young businessmen there in South Bend and in other cities. Maybe earning just enough to make ends meet, but, but men, ambitious hard-working, willing to get somewhere on their own merit. And... Well, you know what I mean. Mm-hmm. Why don't you marry one of them, Bonnie? Oh, it isn't as easy as that, Johnny. You know it. Maybe I was waiting for someone like you to... Mm. I still don't believe in love at first sight. Mm. Good. Well, let me snuggle again. Like before we started this horrible discussion. Mm-hmm. The sun's going down, though, honey. And this little niche in the rocks is going to get cold. Yeah, look. Everybody else has left the beach. Come on, snuggle. I like it. <laughs> Kiss me. And I thought I'd have to ask for it. John. Johnny. What do you do? Well. Hmm? Well, I'll tell you. I live in Hartford, as I told you, and Wait. I'm really... Listen. He's calling you. Yeah, you too. Oh, the spoil sport. Well, maybe it's a word from your dad. Here, up you come. Oh, I hope so. Come on, Johnny. Pedro! Pedro! Over here. Here we are. Here. What's up? Oh, senor, senorita. Telegrams. Telegrams? But the one for the senor was Mark Rush. So I rush. Good boy, Pedro. Here. No, I'll tip you when we get back to the motel. Stop si, by my cottage. Johnny, it, it's... What's wrong, Bonnie? It's from our family doctor. I'm afraid... Here, you read it. Sure, I'll be glad to. Regret having to inform you... Your father died a few hours ago. I suggest you return to South Bend immediately. It was a few minutes before Vonnie could pull herself together enough to walk from the beach up to her cottage where she could pack her things for the trip back to South Bend. I told her I'd make the necessary plane reservations for her. But what I didn't tell her was the contents of the wire I'd received, the one marked Rush. It was from Pat McCracken at Universal Adjustment Bureau. A request to call him at his home in Hartford immediately. I put through the call. Hello, Pat McCracken. Well, Killjoy, what's on your mind? Johnny? That's right. Hey, you got my wire. Why else do you think I'm calling? I tried to get you long distance all day. Your motel didn't seem to know where you were. Well, that was my doing. They might have spoiled a beautiful romance. But what's on your mind? Uh, Johnny, you've got to cut your vacation short. Oh, no, you don't. And you've got to come back to Hartford right away. What? Now, listen, I'm yes. just... But plan to make a long stopover in South Bend, Indiana. South Bend? That's right. Oh, I get it. This is a gag. Or did you know I'd figured maybe on stopping over there anyhow? I don't know what you're talking about, but now listen. If 
By a rare stroke of luck, we just got word of the death this morning of one of Trimutual's bigger policyholders. How much? A million and a half. <sighs> man named Thomas Rene Lamar. Lamar? Pat! Now listen, Johnny. The circumstances lead us to think it may be murder. <laughs> Now, here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's intriguing episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, a set of circumstances arise that are enough to keep a man from trusting even himself. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. It is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone, who also wrote tonight's story. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar, Roy Rowan speaking. Part one of the five-part Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar story, The Lamar Matter, from March 26th. 1956. Ted has a ton of yours truly Johnny Dollar programs, and he has restored those as well. If you go check him out at radiomemories.com, radiomemories.com, shows on cassette, CD, or flash drive for your computer. Start your collection by visiting Ted at radiomemories.com. Visit our webpage, classicradio.stream, classicradio.stream. Stream our shows on demand. You can learn about building a classic radio collection of your own. You can contact me there, find our social media links. And if you're so inclined, you can buy me a coffee. That buy me a coffee money goes toward us acquiring additional classic radio collections and also uh, maintaining our distribution channels. That's at classicradio.stream. Thanks for tuning in. Please thank this station, support their advertisers, and tell your friends the greatest radio shows of all time are right here at this spot on the dial. Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox on your favorite radio station. 